Hey y'all, Coach in the Fight here, talking about the way. That way that the Messiah was talking about that leads to the kingdom of heaven and our Father. Well, in this class, we're going to be defining and making known what that way is. We're going to look in the scripture and we're going to see how our Messiah laid out this way. And we're going to compare it to what we saw in the time of Moses and in the time of Abraham. Turns out this pattern, this way that leads to our father, has been right before our eyes the whole time. But it is only now that we're actually able to understand what this way is. So go ahead and hit that like button and be prepared to leave a comment as we go. In John chapter 14 at verse 6, the Messiah said, I am the way, the truth, and the life, and no man cometh unto the Father but by me. But what did he mean? Now, we did a class yesterday on what it means to take on the name of the Messiah. And we disproved the common doctrine on the subject, which says that you have to understand who the Messiah was see as God sees and live as the Messiah lived in order to take on his name. But we made the argument that until you have actually read the Bible, there's no way for you to know how the Messiah lived and you won't be able to see as God sees. But you can't read the Bible until after you have had the Holy Spirit. So the common doctrine is backwards saying that you have to know who the Messiah is before you could take on his name. And we went on to prove in that class that the only way to receive the name of the Son of God or the seal as it is referred to in the book of Revelation in chapter 7 is through the water of baptism. And when you think about it, I'm sure it makes sense that baptism is actually the first thing that the Messiah actually did when his ministry started. And for the rest of us who plan to walk as he walks, the first thing we'll do is be baptized in water as well. That is how we take on the name of the Son of God. And in this class, we're going to show that that is actually the beginning of what the Messiah called the way or the path to the kingdom of heaven. The first thing they did is get baptized. Now, let's see what it is that we do next. And I'm going to attempt to define this path that the Messiah was talking about by using the examples that he set, as well as the timelines of his ministry. And then we're going to compare that to the ministry of Moses and his timeline, as well as the timeline of Abraham. And then we're going to look at my personal life and my own testimony to see that there's actually an established pattern. And this pattern, I believe, is actually the way that the Messiah was talking about. So let's get started. First, giving honor to our father and creator for allowing us to understand this information in the first place. He doesn't make all things known to all people at all times. If we start to learn a thing, it's only because he has allowed us to learn that thing. So we thank him for imparting this knowledge to us in these end times. Now, let's start over here in the book of Acts in chapter 2. And we're going to work our way backwards, looking at the path in which the disciples took in order to receive the Holy Spirit or the Holy Ghost. Now, we see in Acts chapter 2 that this event happened on Pentecost or the Feast of Weeks. Some call it Shavuot. Pentecost was the feast day that occurred seven weeks after the resurrection of the Christ that we read about back there in John chapter 20 and verse 26. So it was during the Feast of Pentecost that the disciples who had been walking with the Messiah for three and a half years by now have all received the Spirit of God that the Messiah had promised them. But when we back up, we find the Messiah and his disciples partaking in the communion festival known as Passover. 
that's when the Messiah took the cup of the fruit of the vine and the bread and parted it to his disciples saying that that was his blood of the New Testament and his body we see all of this in Matthew chapter 26 and just as an aside note we also see the reference to the kingdom of God there in verse 29 and like I said this is what we're talking about the path to the kingdom of God so now let's back up and let's see if we see a similar pattern during the days of Moses now when we come back to Exodus chapter 19 we see that it was in the third month that the children of Israel who had left Egypt are now settling in the wilderness of Sinai which we know was at the base of Mount Horeb and when we come over to the book of Jubilees and look in chapter 1 we see that it was on the 16th day of the third month that our father called upon Moses to come unto Mount Horeb to receive the covenant and from chapter 44 of this same book we see that the Feast of First Fruits or Pentecost occurred in the middle of the third month so Moses being called to Mount Horeb was part of the Pentecost celebration so just like the days of the disciples when the Holy Spirit descended upon them around Pentecost time we see that the same thing happened during Moses's time and when we back up seven weeks look what we find almost exactly seven weeks earlier we see Moses and the children of Israel partaking in Passover there in Egypt so even with these two passages from the days of Moses and the days of the Messiah we can start to see a pattern emerge where the children of Israel first partake in Passover in the first month and then in the middle of the third month the Holy Spirit descends upon them now let's go back to the days of Abraham so we'll come back to the book of Jubilees in chapter 15 and we look at verse 1 we see Abraham celebrating the feast of first fruits in the third month this was a Pentecost celebration and we see down in verse 4 that the Most High is making a covenant with Abraham during the Feast of Pentecost just like what we saw during Moses's time and just like what we saw during the days of the disciples now we see this same story being talked about in Genesis chapter 15 and verse 18 there we see that the Lord made a covenant with Abram and we learn from Jubilees that it was on the middle of the third month which would have been the Feast of Pentecost again that was chapter 15 and verse 18 but look what's going on in the previous chapter and verse 18 you have Melchizedek king of Salem bringing bread and wine to Abram in other words the priest of the Most High God has visited with Abram in order to have a Passover celebration they're having communion with this bread and the wine the same as we saw with the Messiah and his disciples and in the very next chapter we see the father once again descending on Abraham and making a covenant with him this pattern has been established in Abraham's time in Moses' time and in the Messiah's time this I believe and you guys are welcome to jump down in the comment section if you think I'm off track with this but I believe that the father is allowing us to understand his way or the path that the Messiah was talking about to the kingdom of heaven one of the first things that we'll do is we'll go through Passover it is then that we will experience what Jeremiah is talking about in verse 31 and verse 8 where the father tells him that he will gather his people from the ends of the earth to the feast of Passover and then 50 days later these same people who have celebrated Passover are visited by the Most High 
who brings them the law like he did in the days of Moses or makes a covenant with him like he did in the days of Abraham or both like he did in the days of the Messiah. In other words, after you have kept the feast of Passover in the first month, it is in the middle of the third month that you can actually expect the new covenant, which is also talked about in this same chapter of Jeremiah, to be placed on our hearts. We celebrate the feast of Passover in the first month and then the new covenant descends upon us in the third month according to this pattern that we see from the days of Abraham, Moses and the Messiah. And as a side note, let me stress once again that we have to be baptized first. That is actually the first step. And of course, we remember the baptism of the Messiah when the spirit descended upon him like a dove. But when you look back in the days of Moses, you can see the baptism, which then was in the form of circumcision, being talked about in the same chapter 12 that is talking about the Passover celebration. So the path is baptism first, then Passover, then the Feast of Pentecost when the New Covenant is placed on our hearts. Now, before I get into my personal testimony, let me show you a few scriptures that supports this idea, particularly Exodus chapter 13, when they are instructed to keep the Feast of Passover and unleavened bread. We see in verse 9 that Passover or Particularly the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a sign upon thine hand and a memorial between thine eyes. But look there where it says that the Lord's law may be in thy mouth. So the way I understand this is before you keep the Feast of Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread, the law will not be on your lips. Now, that shouldn't be a surprise to anybody if the law is not written on your heart. How could it then be on your lips? But anyway, let's come over to the general epistle of Barnabas and let's look at how this all works. Chapter 8 of the epistle of Barnabas is talking about the construction of the third temple or New Jerusalem as we call it. This temple, of course, is to be built on our hearts and will consist of the new covenant that will also be in our hearts. But notice that verse 21 says, having received remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord, we are become renewed, being again created as it were from the beginning. Wherefore, God truly dwells in our house, that is, in us. So what this is saying is that by receiving the remission of our sins and trusting in the name of the Lord, which we established is baptism, we have now created an environment within ourselves to be the temple of the Father. He can now come and dwell within us. Well, it is through baptism that we take on the name of the Lord and it is through Passover that we get the remission of sins, cleansing our inner tabernacles and creating an environment that our father can now dwell in. So the entire path is summarized in this one verse, baptized first, then Passover, then the new covenant or the third temple built inside of our hearts. Now, as my own personal testimony, I'll tell you that this is exactly how it happened for me as well. It was in 2015 that our father put on my heart for me and my wife to get baptized again. And we did in February when I baptized her and then she turned around and baptized me in the bathtub. And it was shortly after that that my father put it on my heart the Feast of Passover and allowed me to understand that we were supposed to be doing communion during the Feast of Passover. Now, I hadn't heard anybody talk about that up until that point, 
but I was so convicted that I went out and bought two bottles of Morgan David and donated it to the church so that they could all partake in the feast of Passover. And it was on the day of Pentecost of that same year that our father allowed me to understand what the book of the covenant was. Up until that point, I, like many people, thought that the law was 613 different rules found throughout the Bible by some guy named Rambam. But it was on Pentecost of the year 2015 that I realized, thanks to the Father, that the law wasn't the 613 different laws, but was only the four chapters found in the book of Exodus, chapter 20, 21, 22, and 23. So, just like Abraham, Moses, and the disciples, it started with baptism before the Feast of Passover when I communed with the bread and the wine. And then there was a 50-day waiting period before the Father visited me spiritually and brought me knowledge of the covenant. I think this is the way it happens for everybody. And I think this is what the Messiah was talking about when he says that he is the way, the truth and the life. He fulfilled this path for us to get back to the Father and the kingdom of heaven, allowing us to be baptized or cleansed before we go through the communion supper, awaiting for the Holy Spirit to descend upon us during Pentecost. So are you in the way? Are you on the path to the kingdom of heaven and our father? Well, once again, let's explore the pattern of things. First, there is baptism and then Passover. Now, some of you will be in grave error by saying that you have been baptized before. There's at least one of you out there in comment land that's taking credit for a baptism that you received when you was four years old. But that same individual is in error for doing so because based on his own testimony, he does not believe in keeping Passover or the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And when you look in Exodus chapter 12, verse 15 and verse 19, you see that if you do not keep the Feast of Passover, our Father will cut you off from the congregation of Israel. So you have to look in your own life. If you have not been baptized in water, there's no way that you are on the path. And even if you have been baptized in water and there was a break between the time that you was baptized and the time that you've kept the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover, you defiled yourself and your baptism doesn't count for your righteousness anymore because you was cut off. Using my own life as an example, when I was 16 years old, I was first baptized into the name of the Son of God. But because I did not keep Passover or unleavened bread, I was cut off. And that baptism, which is the seal of God, was actually broken. And it was the same in 1995 when I was told to get baptized again, not knowing that I was supposed to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread or Passover. I once again was cut off, making that baptism of null effect. And many of you are in the same boat. You were baptized not knowing what that baptism was for and not knowing that you were supposed to keep the communion festival of Passover to renew that baptism and not knowing that you were supposed to keep the Feast of Unleavened Bread, you didn't do so and you wiped away that baptism, making it null effect. So now, in order for you to get on the path, you're going to have to be baptized again, just like I was in 2015. Then you will be on the path and you will stay on that path as long as you keep the feast days, particularly the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We can thank our Father we have time in order to get this right. We learned in the book of Gad the Seer that we are now in what's known as the Ten Days of Awe, or the Ten Years in which our Father has given us in order to learn to live within His law, which include these feast days. So, 
Don't worry if you haven't gotten this all right. Be thankful that we are given another chance. And for those who don't see the necessity in obeying the covenant or being baptized, it's probably because you are cut off. And if you don't get back on this path, if you don't understand this way, at the end of these 10 days of awe, you see there in verse 12 of the book called the Gad, the seer in chapter 14, it says, and the Lord said to Satan, these are your share. Take them and do what you want with them. And Satan took the wicked to the wasteland to destroy them. This is what happens to those who don't find this path. So if you have no desire to go into the wasteland with Satan, you better find this path. Because like the Messiah said over in Matthew chapter 7, Enter ye in at the straight gate, for wide is the gate, and broad is the way that leadeth to destruction, and many there be which go in thereat. Because straight is the gate, and narrow is the path which leadeth unto life, and few there be that find it.